Okay, announcements. Sunday is Christmas Eve, and we will have our usually Christmas Eve evening type of service Sunday morning since it's, uh, it's on a Sunday. And so we're going to do some of the things like we normally do on a Christmas Eve service, which includes having uh, the Lord's table. And uh, rather than having that early in the service like we normally do, we will have it at the end like we normally do on Christmas Eve, closing out uh, with the Lord's table. So be prepared for that. Those of you who uh, live stream at home can be prepared with your uh, elements uh, for that. So that will be um, that will be Sunday morning. And then uh, I think there's, st- I don't know if there's still decorations out there. There will be no Chris- uh, New Year's Eve service. Uh, we have never uh, followed in that tradition. Now, why is it that I'm not projecting anything? Okay. There we go, and sound comes on too, so that makes it a lot better. That was my user error. All right, I thought I would entertain you with a very light, very uh, short video that comes from the underbelly of the world. (laughs) Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Did y'all hear that? Mm-hmm. Great. So I got word today that they were going through um, one of the straits down there with uh, four meter seas, and it was a little rough to walk. But other than that, they weren't seasick or anything, so they were doing okay. So uh, they'll be back on Friday. So please continue to pray for them. Pretty short. Hmm. Pray short. (laughs) How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our God shall stand forever. So before we get started, we'll make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord. We'll give everyone a few moments of silent prayer to make sure you're in right relationship with the Lord, confessing sin if necessary, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that we have forgiveness of sins, that we have peace with you, and that we are declared righteous simply by faith in the cross. Now, Father, as we continue our study in this lesson uh, related to understanding Abraham's justification, that you might help us all understand this extremely important doctrine related to salvation. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Okay, now, what we have been doing here is going through the... Uh, various events in the Old Testament. And we haven't done this in a couple of lessons, so everybody needs to stand up, and we need to go through the motions as we remember uh, all of these different events. We have a, a 11 Old Testament events and 9 New Testament events, and we can go through it in about 30 seconds or so, and then everybody will have their um, be able to present the Bible to somebody in a very short form. All right, ready? Creation fall, flood, tower of Babel, call of Abraham, exodus, ten commandments, which is the giving of the Mosaic law. Then we have the conquest of the land. Then we have the united kingdom, where there's one kingdom, then it splits into two kingdoms. And then there is the exile. And first the northern kingdom goes out, then the southern kingdom goes out. Then there's a partial return that brings us to the end of the Old Testament. Then the New Testament begins with the birth of Jesus, and then he will be crucified. He will be buried for three days. Then he will rise from the dead. Then 40 days later, he will ascend to heaven. Ten days later, he will send the Holy Spirit, which is the birth of the church. 
The church ends with the rapture of the church where we go up and meet the Lord in the air. Then there is the seven-year tribulation. Jesus returns to the earth, defeats the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan, and establishes his kingdom. That ends with the uh, great white throne judgment for only all the unbelievers. Okay, great job. Sit down. Getting that covered. We have looked last time uh, and before we looked at the call of Abraham. Now, what we were focusing on in the lesson last week was this concept of justification. This is difficult for people to understand. It's abstract. It's not concrete. We think of righteousness mostly in a very experiential way, but the righteousness that saves is a judicial righteousness that is credited to our account. It is counted for us, and one way of translating it, it's imputed to us. And we are declared righteous. We are not made righteous. That is a, uh, a false view that is very close to the Roman Catholic doctrine of infused righteousness. And so this is not infused righteousness. We are declared righteous by God, not because of anything in us, but because we have been credited with the righteousness of Christ. So that when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness and not our unrighteousness because we're still sinners. And a good way to remember this is that God imputes righteousness. He does not impart righteousness. He credits it to our account. Now, one of the interesting things that someone uh, might ask me is, well, wait a minute. When you come to Romans 5.19, it says that many will be made righteous. I thought you said that God imputes righteousness or declares us righteous. He doesn't make us righteous. Ah, but this is one of those little gems you get when you look, actually look at the Greek instead of at the English. And so I have the words there at the bottom. They are not the normal words for making something or infusing something into somebody. It's the word based on histemi, which means to stand, and it's the word kathistemi, and it's used in both phrases. So what we have in 519 is the statement, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That's referring to Adam. When Adam disobeyed, not Eve's sin, but Adam's sin, it led to the fall of the human race because he is the head of the race, both biologically as well as federally. They were made sinners. Now, here's where grammar is important. You know, it's always fun to talk about fun things in grammar. The other day, I got a text, and it said that, uh, you know, Santa's helpers, are they subordinate clauses? <laughs> so... This is one of those cases. Many were made righteous. What tense is that? It's, in the Greek is an aorist tense, which basically in this case is like a simple past. It just summarizes something that happened in the past. When Adam sinned, uh, th his descendants are all made unrighteous. They're made sinners. So that refers to something that is made. So also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. What tense is that? It's future. When does that happen? It happens at glorification. That's when we're made righteous. When we are separated from our physical body and separated from the sin nature, and we, have, uh, we are saved from the presence of sin. And that's clear if we were going to go into a detailed study of very, various parallel statements made all through this section. So this is not talking about justification. Justification is what is stated at the end of the previous verse. Therefore, it's through one man's offense, that would be Adam, 
Uh, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, one man's righteous act, that is Christ's death on the cross, one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in, and most, most uh, translations will say something like, um, like justification for life. But see, the same word that's translated justification is also translated righteousness. And this is the issue that we are, have received the imputation of righteousness. And it's a declaration that we are just. So when he, he declares that we are righteous because of the imputation of Christ's righteousness. So there we have the use of dikaiosis. Related to dekaio, the verb dekaiosune, which is the quality of righteousness, and it's that idea of a declaration of righteousness, a judicial declaration of righteous, righteousness. So last time when we got into this, uh, we were really talking about issues that underlie this whole th doctrine of justification and understanding salvation in the Old Testament. Because as I pointed out, and as I've been having discussions with um, uh, Amos and Jen over how to articulate some of these things in this lesson, and they're working at, at, at rewriting it, I've taken my stab at rewriting it, which is not always easy to take something that is organized one way and reorganizing it and everything, especially if you're trying to do uh, three or four other presentations a, a week. So it ta writing takes a lot of time to get it correct. So we looked at this last time, talking about how are people justified before the cross? How would Abraham know about God's promise of salvation, and on what basis was he justified? Now, a good place to start, if you're teaching kids, is with this statement from one of Job's friends in Job 25.4. This is the issue. This is the issue that we should all uh, be raising, and that is, how can a man be righteous before God? How can a man be righteous before God? And this is a very important word in the Hebrew that we talked about Sunday morning. In fact, what I taught on Sunday morning is basically a tract I have been writing targeting a really a Jewish audience. Because if you noticed, I don't know if anybody was observant enough to notice, I didn't, I think maybe I referred to one New Testament passage in the whole thing. I presented the whole gospel from the Old Testament, the importance of righteousness. And that's a big word in Judaism, tzedakah. It refers to their good deeds and uh, their charitable works, all of those things. And, you know, when I trace that through from uh, Genesis 15, 6, all the way through, there is a tremendous picture of the fact that justification at, uh, which is sedic is based on, and and the imputation of righteousness based on sedica, is the result of faith, faith in God's promise of salvation, and you can just trace that. It's a great way to present the gospel uh, to somebody with a Jewish background. So what I'm going to do this evening, we're going to look at this. The topic is justification. The key idea is that we are declared righteous. We are not made righteous. So whether you're teaching young children, older children, adults, that's the key idea to get across. That is the biblical teaching. The word dekaio is a word meaning to declare in a judicial context someone to be uh, righteous. And so God declared Abraham uh, to be righteous. And that is the pattern, as we see from Paul's use of it in Romans 4, as the pattern for how everyone is justified. So to just summarize the structure here of what I'm going to talk about tonight, the outline, we're going to first look at uh, this statement of faith, how Abraham chose to believe God, and that this was the means of his justification. I noticed in some translations, in a couple of verses, they will slip in the word because justified because of faith. That is not in the original. It is just like we find in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not because of faith. And the preposition in the Greek that's used there is the preposition dia. If it uses a, 
an, if the object of the preposition is in the genitive case, it indicates means or instrument. If it's in the accusative case, it indicates cause. We are not saved because of faith. We are saved through faith. The cause of faith is God's mercy, God's love. So the first thing we're going to look at is, it, and you're going to feel like, oh, gee, it just seems like that's what we heard last Tuesday night. That's what we heard Sunday morning. That's what we're hearing again tonight. Good. The final will be Thursday night. How did Abraham come to know about Yahweh? When did Abraham first believe God's promise of salvation as it was revealed in early Genesis? C, what does it mean that Abraham believed in Yahweh as the statement says? Does that mean he believed he existed? Does that mean he believed the promise that Abraham just made or the promise, I mean, the promise that God had just made or the promise he made in Genesis 12 through? What does it mean that Abraham believed in Yahweh? And fourth, D, what does it mean that the Lord counted him as righteous? And... Um, so in some of these translations, I make a note here in the New Living Translation, it uses the phrase because of faith. But that's not the only translation that makes that mistake in places. Then we'll talk about James 2.23 that identifies Abram as the friend of God. And then some lessons from Abram's life and God's covenant with him. And in the second point, we'll get to that, but we'll probably come back because there's some important... Um, aspects there because it talks about Abram being justified at the time that he was offering Isaac as a sacrifice in, in uh, Genesis 22. Well, wait a minute. I thought he was justified before Genesis 12. Right. We have two different kinds of justification going on. And so I need to clarify that a little bit as well. So Genesis 15, 6 says, and he, that is Abram, believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. The NET says Abram believed the Lord. Notice not in the Lord. There is no preposition in there. He believed the Lord and the Lord credited it as righteousness to him. So that is uh, gives you an idea of English variance there. So Abram believed in the Lord. He accounted him righteousness. So Four questions, which I just went over. How did Abram come to know about Yahweh? How did he know about God? I mean, he's over there in the midst of a moon-worshipping, idolatrous culture in Ur of the Chaldees. How does he come to know the truth about Yahweh? Uh, second, when did Abram first believe God's promise of salvation as revealed in early Genesis? See, third, what does it mean that Abram believed in Yahweh? And fourth, what does it mean that the Lord counted him as righteous? So we'll work our way through each of these four. So the first one, how did Abram come to know about Yahweh? Basically, the way everybody else does from the time of the garden. Either they begin with a physical witness from God's creation, or they begin with somebody telling them about God. Those are the only two options. And so we have the testimony that is sufficient for making us responsible for the truth in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. So that tells us that there's revelation. It is nonverbal. It communicates knowledge, and knowledge that is sufficient to hold us accountable uh, for the existence of God. And Romans 1.19 makes this just as clear, where Paul wrote, They know the truth. This is from the New Living Translation. I thought the way they did this was very good. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. There's not a single atheist on the planet that is a genuine atheist in the center of their heart. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible attributes his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. 
the all question was always raised for many centuries, well, what about those who never heard? Well, there is no one who never heard. Just as you can hear something that you don't hear physically, you can see something that is invisible. And you can see the existence of God all around us. And God tells us that every molecule screams the necessity of an intelligent designer. Now, that's a different kind of argument. But to look at anything, if you go out and you look at an, some of these very expensive two or $300,000 cars, you look at it, we marvel at the engineering. And today, it's very different from 100 years ago because you get into many cars... And the t uh, all the technology in there, all the electronics and the digital stuff, um, I mean, my last car, which I had for about almost 11 years, I still discovered things. I'd punch a button and it would do something. I, I didn't know that happened. That would do that. It, it is amazing. And all of that is engineering. And what that tells you is that these engineers are really smart. They are unbelievable. And then we look at the planet around us and we say, all of this just happened by chance. Really? You know, you can look at a Maserati and say, oh, this, this, this is a remarkable uh, engineering feat. And then you look at a, a, a cell and all of the submolecular parts of a cell. And you say that happened by chance. Really? I don't think so. So all of that testifies to the existence of God. And so Romans 121 says, yes, they knew God, but they would not worship him. See, the failure to, to, to desire to know the creator that is yelling at you through the evidence of his creation, the, the desire to turn away from him is, is rebellion. It's rejection. You don't want to know because you want to be your own God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks and they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like as a result. Their minds became dark and confused. So we use two terms that we often talk about and a lot of people get confused on. One is God consciousness and the other is an age of accountability. I'm going to say something about the age of accountability first and then we'll talk about God consciousness. An age of accountability is not a particular age. It could be 2, it could be 5, it could be 15, it could be 45. It has to do with when a person reaches God consciousness. And that's going to vary from family to family, from nation to nation, from culture to culture. And if you grow up in a family where you are constantly being told the gospel and you're being read the Bible and you're listening, for example, I know this is true in a personal case, uh, where the mother was teaching a good news club and took her little two-year-old uh, girl with her. And one day the little girl looked at her when they got back in the car and said, Mommy, you always ask the other boys and girls if they want to uh, accept Jesus as their Savior, but you never ask me. Two years old. She heard it two or three times a week, week after week after week. And I've heard some pastors talk about that they were pro they they believe they were saved when they were two or three, according to their uh, parents' testimony. So it's going to vary. If you're someplace where you're buried deep in the center of Mecca, then you may not reach God consciousness until who knows when. Or if you're buried deep in uh, the upper Amazon, uh, you come to some awareness of something and maybe at some age when you're in your adolescent years you think that there's something out there and then you start worshiping other gods. So God consciousness is when a person becomes old enough to begin to wonder where everything came from. Who made the stars? Who made the sun, the moon, and the earth? Who made me? Uh, all of this it leads to the awareness that there is some kind of higher power or supreme power or supreme being or person greater than mankind. And at that point, the individual becomes responsible. Decide to, well, do I want to know who really created everything? 
Or do I just say, oh, well, everybody else just worshiped the trees and they worshiped the animals and the spirit gods and the wind and nature and whatever. And so um, that's the age of accountability is when they reach that point of God consciousness. And we know from what we've been studying, this goes to the creator-creature distinction. At some point, the creature wants to know how he got there. And the person at God consciousness either turns to the creator or turns to the creation as the source. Romans 1, to 25 says, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. They're worshiping God's creation, not the creator. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. See, they knew the truth. That's the previous verses. But they don't want to know the truth. And they worshiped and served the cre creation is a better translation than creature. They worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now God, because God is just, will always send somebody to tell those who want to know more about him. God desires all to be saved. This is in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God wants to save as many as he can. He is delaying the coming of Jesus until uh, he, to be able to get as many as he can, gather them in uh, to, the, to the church. And so that is God's grace. Okay, the second question we're looking at, B, is when did Abraham first believe God's promise of salvation as it was revealed in early Genesis? Well, the answer is the Bible didn't tell us. It's silent about that. Some people aren't comfortable with that. They say, well, why doesn't God tell us? Because God didn't write the Bible to satisfy your curiosity. That's a, blind, that, that's a blinding flash of the obvious for some people. God didn't write the Bible to answer all of our little questions. He had a purpose for the way he wrote the Bible, the way he did. And when we look at the first five books of the Bible, they were written by Moses. Moses wrote them while the Israelites were in the desert for 40 years under the inspiration of Scripture, he had source material that he could take uh, and that he could get information from, but God, the Holy Spirit, was overseeing uh, the whole thing. And the purpose of Genesis 1 through 11 is to show the need for God's call of Abraham in Genesis 12.1, that God worked through the entire human race and they continuously ended up in rebellion and sin and evil, and so God changed his modus operandi to op thinking through uh, or working through one individual, and that was Abraham. And so there's a lot of things that aren't covered. Eleven chapters uh, cover about two and a half to three thousand years, and yet we're just told a tiny, tiny amount. So it doesn't tell us. But it was, secondly, it was in the past. It's not at the time of the events in Genesis 15, 1 through 5, for two reasons. First of all, the Hebrew grammar breaks the sequence of events. Hebrew narrative is very simple. It sounds very redundant when people translate it into English because it's the verbs begin with a conjunction, and he said, and he did, and he went here, and he went there, and he went there, and so it just flows. It's telling the story in a sequence of events. But if the, the narrator or the writer wants to break the sequence of events, he'll shift the verb tense. Now, in, in Hebrew, there's only two verb tenses. There's a perfect and an imperfect. So when all of a sudden there's a shift, you have a whole string of imperfect verbs and it shifts to perfect, you know that the writer has stopped the progression of events and he's making a point of some kind. And so what's happening is he's making a point to remind the reader that Abram had already been saved. 
He had already been justified. And so he's telling them in light of God's promise that the seed promise will come through Abraham's physical descendants. He is saying basically, now remember, Abram had already believed in Yahweh and Yahweh counted him as righteous. That happened when? Well, some people think that it happened, it's related to the promise that was just made. And I don't think that's right. There's nothing in that promise that relates to salvation, sin, or the death of a sacrifice. Some people, good men, think that it was the promise that God made that was foreshadowing the Abrahamic covenant, that God would give him innumerable descendants, and that God would... uh, that he would be a blessing to, to all nations and that God would give him a specific piece of real estate. But there's nothing in there, I think, that is, fits the pattern of salvation in the rest of Scripture. So that's the second point. Throughout the Bible, justification, salvation, is always connected to the death of a sacrifice, to the shedding of blood and as, as payment for the penalty of sin. Now, there's a lot of debate over this, but I think that we have enough information to solve this. We talked about this last time, so I won't belabor the point. What had already been revealed about God's plan of salvation for mankind in those first 11 chapters of Genesis? Again, the same answer, not much. In fact, the only indications we have that are related to Uh, a sacrifice and salvation come at the end of Genesis 3 after uh, after the sin of Adam and Eve. First of all, God goes through and tells them all about the consequences that are going to come because they now live in a fallen world and they're now sinners. And in these first 15 chapters going up to 15, 6, there's not one use of the word believe or counted, imputed, reckoned, not that Hebrew word is not used until Genesis 15, 6, and righteousness, that's not used. So, so how were people saved? It doesn't talk about it. Obviously, it isn't mentioned at all. The key words are not found. So didn't they believe? Sure they believed. We just know it from what later writers tell us because that wasn't part of God's purpose in uh, Moses recording this. In Hebrews 11, 4 through 7, it tells us that Abel, Enoch, and Noah also had great faith. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. So we know that they exercised faith, but it's just not mentioned in Genesis at all. So we know that many people believe God's promise of salvation, and it's hinted at And only by looking at later patterns are we able to understand those hints. Uh, So there were thousands upon thousands, probably hundreds of thousands that got saved. Because the population by the time the flood comes is is probably four, five, six billion people on the planet because you have 10, 12 generations all living at at the same time. And they're having they're having more than 1.5 children. In my first church, I had a couple of older ladies in the church, different families, and they were there. One fam, one lady had fourteen siblings; the other one had seventeen siblings. That was not uncommon, because of the high rate of infant mortality up till the twentieth century, and so you ha- would have people who would just uh, have as many as they could, hoping that. Uh, four or five or six of them would actually make it to adulthood. Now, before sin, God had warned Adam when they were in perfect environment not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The instant they did that, they would certainly die. So there was a penalty for disobeying God. We know that that was put into effect because as soon as they ate in Genesis 3-7, we're told that the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. All of a sudden they they saw their situation, they're naked, they're exposed, they're vulnerable. And so they said, we got to cover up. And so it's interesting that they made coverings for themselves. And the word for that is for something like a loincloth. 
something that is less than the coverage of a diaper, okay? It's pretty skimpy. And, but there's a contrast because when God clothes them, it's with tunics. It covers, covers their whole body. So they heard the sound of the Lord and they hid themselves. And when God says, why are you hiding from me? They said, because we heard you coming and we were afraid. So something radical has happened. They're spiritually dead. They're separated, uh, separated from God. So after they disobeyed God, immediately they became unrighteous and they were no longer compatible with God. So something had to change their status from being unrighteous to being righteous. So they were spiritually dead, separated from God. Now Genesis 3.15 gives us the hint. This is often referred to as the proto Evangelium, the first hint at the gospel, really, where God is talking to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So her seed refers to, to the Messiah. It's an unusual phrase. Women have eggs. They don't have sperma. That's the word that's used there in the Greek. And he says, um, uh, he, that is the seed of the woman, shall bruise your head. That would be a fatal wound and uh, a f- a f- has finality. Uh, you shall bruise his heel. That, for a viper, that's still a fatal wound, but Jesus rose from the dead. And so that's when he was able to finally fully defeat Satan. So God then, as I pointed out last week, he's going to make tunics of skin for them. The word here for skin is a word that is only used of the skin of an animal after the animal has died and the skin has been removed. So he's making tunics of skin, which indicates that he had to kill the animal, had to show them how to kill the animal. This is a process that probably took several days. God's teaching them a lot during that time. God's just not sitting over there on a rock uh, waiting for time to go by looking at his watch. He's going to make use of that to teach them a lot of things they're going to need to know living in this new environment and giving them information about a sacrifice, what kind of an animal. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because we, because in the next chapter, when Abel brings a sacrifice, he brings a firstborn from the flock. Well, how did he know to bring the firstborn? You know, there's information, obviously, that's been given that's not being revealed to us. So there's the shedding of blood. This is a sacrifice. A lot of people will say, well, it doesn't say it's a sacrifice, so it wasn't a sacrifice. Well, you have to be hit over the head with a two-by-four every time you, you look at something in the Scriptures. Hebrews 9.22b makes a universal statement. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. At the time of Adam, at the time of Noah, at the time of Abraham, at the time of David, at the time of... Uh, Jesus at the time of the apostles. It's true now. With, apart from the shedding of blood, which is an idiom for death, there is no forgiveness. So we, ha- we can't say that the salvific promise for Abraham was that I'm going to uh, give you s- some land and I'm going to give you innumerable descendants and I'm going to make you a blessing for all the nations. There's nothing in there that fits the pattern that throughout Scripture that apart from the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So Abel brought from the firstborn of his flock and their fat. Now, why is he bringing fat? And I think that is to show that God's blessing, that it's a fattened up animal. Uh, that's the best answer I've heard. I've asked a lot of vets and a lot of other people, why is there this emphasis? And that was the best answer I heard. And that came from a theologian, not a veterinary. They didn't know. So the conclusion is that Abram's faith was in response to God's gracious provision of a solution to the problem of a lack of righteousness by justification through faith in a promise of a future provision of a Savior who would have victory over sin and Satan. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. So that's, that's the general idea. And you, get, you go forward from Abel to Noah. Noah gets off the ark. Well, first of all, he's told to take seven 
uh, clean animals on the ark. Well, why? Where do you learn the difference between clean and unclean? That's not stated in Genesis 1 through 6. But he seemed to know what the difference was. The extra one was for a sacrifice. When he got off the ark, he, he had a sacrifice, and then God made a, made a covenant with him. Now, the third question we ask, C, is what does it mean that Abram believed in Yahweh? He believed God. He believed God's promise. But what promise? The promise that he made in Genesis 3.15, the promise illustrated through the sacrifice. For Abram, it has to, that promise has to conform with what is true for the salvation promise all the way through the Bible. And that has to do with uh, the death of a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, we're told in Hebrews, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, but they taught that there was one who would come who would fulfill the sacrifices and that his future death would take care of the sin problem. So Abraham, in the chart, we have Abraham, approximately 2000 B.C., and he is believing that in the future, and we know this occurred in 33 A.D. when Christ uh, was crucified. So fourth question, D, is what does it mean that the Lord counted him as righteousness? So we have to break this down a little bit. Uh, first of all, be reminded that sin, unrighteousness, is what separates us from God. Isaiah 59 uh, 2 says that your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so he will not hear. Some of you have asked the question, well, does God hear the prayer of unbelievers? This is a great verse for that. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. He's talking to the Jewish people and he is saying that because of your sins, God's not going to hear your prayers. I remember when, I think it was Jimmy Draper, he was pastor of First Baptist Church in Oklahoma City back in the, back in the late 70s. He was elected president of the um, Southern Baptist Convention. Somebody asked him if God hears the prayers of the Jewish people, and he said, no, not if they're not believers in Christ. Oh, the uproar in the press. They crucified Draper because of that. What a bigot. You know, these are holy people. These are God's people. Of course he hears their prayer. Well, wait a minute, one of their own prophets, Isaiah says, because of their sin, talking about it to, directly to his generation, uh, that God has hidden his face and he will not hear. It's the same principle through time. Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as a filthy rag, as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities have like the wind taking us away. So we have this, he includes himself. We are all like an unclean thing. All our righteousness are filthy rags. So this, this is every human being. And unrighteous, filthy people cannot wash themselves clean. So now we have some charts. Now I'll say something about these charts. There are several charts in the lesson as it's been written that I think need to be tweaked a little bit. And I've tweaked some of them and put them into this, this lesson. But there is, I'll get to another chart, and I'll, show you, I'll talk about how it's written and why I have a problem with it. But this is a good chart as it stands. You have the verse at the top, Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. See that because, see the problem there? That, that's not what it says in the text. And, but that's from the New Living Translation, which they use a lot, but they're not adverse at all to changing it to something else. So on the left you have this chart. It, this word is a, an accounting term to count something. And so in a financial se sense, it is crediting or depositing something in someone's account. So on the left we have Abram, or the believer, and they have righteousness being credited to that account. It's the righteousness from Christ. See, God's timeless. So at the same instant that he's seeing Abraham believe, he's seeing Christ being crucified. So he knows to, he, he's, he's making that retroactively effective. God credited, deposited, or deposited Jesus' perfect righteousness into Abraham's account. 
It's on the basis of what Christ did on the cross that we are given God's righteousness. The other arrow goes off to the right, and it has a legal sense in which it says to, means to make a judgment or to declare something. So God, as the perfect righteous judge, made a judgment in his heavenly courtroom because we possess the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ, made a judgment in his heavenly courtroom and declared Abraham to be righteous. It is a courtroom term. You are righteous. It's interesting to see all the different terms that are used. One word we use is innocent. We often think of innocent in line with something that's naive. They're just innocent. They're naive. But it's a judicial term. It, it not only means you're not guilty, it means you're not guilty of anything. You're, you're cleared of all legal infractions. So many of these terms, confession, Confession is a term that is a legal term. It's used in the courtroom. If we confess our sins. So a lot of people read that, well, you have to have remorse. Really? Do you think if you go into a court and have remorse that that's going to sway the judge? Well, it might with all these liberal judges we have now because they don't care about facts. But uh, back when we actually had good judges who followed law, uh, how you felt didn't matter. You could go in there and cry and whine and tell all the sob stories, and it, it wouldn't matter. I remember when we first moved to Connecticut, a speed limit on a highway, in, uh, you know, like a farm-to-market road, a ranch road here in Texas that's 65 or 70 was about 50 or 45 in Connecticut. I was in trouble. You can see where this is going. So it wasn't long before I got my first ticket. And so I just paid it. Then I got a second ticket. I paid that, and I thought, man, they're going to take my license away. Then I got a third ticket. And this was a wonderful police officer, and uh, after he finished writing me a ticket, he, for some reason, he went back to his car, then he came back. He said, you know, I should have asked you, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a pastor. He said, oh, no. He said, you know, God watches out for me, so I try to watch out for rabbis and priests and pastors. I'll tell you what to do. You just... Um, you just go into court when you get your court date. Go in and sign in. Make sure you sign in Pastor Dean or Reverend Dean or whatever. And what the judge will do is he will take your fine. He'll cut it in half and say, just make a donation. Send me the receipt, receipt to your favorite charity. And as long as it's not the church. And then that won't go, go on your record. So you reach a certain time in your life when, when you get a speeding ticket for going 10, 15, 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, and you just go, oh, well. You go to court. Oh, I'm so sorry, officer. I'm so sorry, judge. I'll never do that again. You don't want to fine. You're just trying to act remorseful. But in court, your emotions don't matter. He just wants to know, are you going to plead guilty or not guilty? He doesn't care how you feel. Feeling is not the issue when we confess sin. It is admitting and acknowledging guilt that we have committed a sin. And so um, God's a righteous judge. And when we say, you know, I've been arrogant, I've been worried, I've been fearful, I've been anxious, but Christ paid for those sins. We're instantly... You know, God knows Christ paid for those sins, but that's our, we're making our case that I am to be forgiven and the slate wiped clean because Christ already paid for them. That's 1 John, 1 John 1, 7. So when we appear before God, he's going to say, what kind of righteousness do you have? And if we say, well... I've got this righteous garment that was given to me by Jesus Christ. He says, okay, you're in. And if we say, well, look at all these good deeds that I did. He says, no, you're out. It's what Christ did that matters, not what we did. So Jesus died. This is point A. Jesus died in mankind's place so that people do not need to die the eternal death. With no sin of his own, Jesus could go to the cross 
and he could die in our place. He could be a sufficient sacrifice as our substitute. 1 Peter 2.24 says about Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Then in Colossians 2.14 talking about what happened at the, at the cross and God's judicial action, he wiped out the handwriting of requirements or the certificate of debt against us, the debt of sin. It was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Notice he took it out of the way in A.D. 33, not in 1975 when you trusted Christ as Savior, or 1987, or in 2015. He took it out of the way because the sin penalty is paid in AD 33, so that the sin penalty isn't the issue. The issue now becomes your lack of righteousness. That's why we need to be justified, and we can't produce that righteousness on our own. So here's a chart. Now, in the way it's written in the, in the curriculum, there's a zero in the middle that indicates that man could move to a point of innocence. It's labeled as innocence, but I don't think that's true. I think that you're either unrighteous or you're righteous. You're, just because the sin penalty is paid does not move us to a position of innocence. It just means the penalty's paid. But we're still unrighteous, and we have to be given the righteousness of, of, of God. So there's a chart here on the left. It needs, there needs a death to pay for sin, which is what we've said all along. The penalty for sin is death. Paying the penalty does not provide righteousness. It just pays the penalty. In addition, if we, once that's paid, then we might need to lead a perfect life by God's standards, but... No one can do that. To be right with God, an absolutely perfect, obedient, righteous life must have been lived. Well, we're just out of luck. Looking around here, I've known some of you many, many, many years. I've known some of you just a few years, but I can tell. Everybody here has a list I could not enumerate of sins already committed today. And you're not any different from anybody else. We're all that way. The number of mental attitude sins that we've committed just driving to church for Bible class, dealing with the imbeciles on the road is just beyond our comprehension. Jesus lived a perfect life, and God imputes or credits his righteous life to our account when we believe in him. That's the transaction. So in this chart, we see that Jesus paid the penalty of death for us and that he lived a perfect life, and so his righteousness is imputed to us. He is our substitute. We can't do it. He did it for us. This is what Scripture teaches. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, that is God the Father, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, this verse relates to what's happening to a church-age believer because our righteousness is in him. And the instant we trust in Christ, not only are we justified, regenerated, reconciled, we'll talk about that in a minute, but we are entered, baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. We're identified with his death, burial, and resurrection. But in the Old Testament... While they were not baptized into the body of Christ, they were justified by faith, and Ab uh, Abraham is that example. Romans 5, 18 and 19. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. So we're all under condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. This is the declaration of justification, declaration of righteousness. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous in the future. 
glorification when we're absent from the body face to face with the Lord. But Abraham didn't know anything about Jesus, didn't know the name, didn't know any of these details, never heard of the cross. How's he made righteous? The same way. Jesus paid the penalty for all. Old Testament, New Testament, believe every human being, every sin, from Adam's sin to the great white throne judgment. And that it, death is applied to Abraham, even though he doesn't know anything about it. He believes the promise that this will happen in the future. And since the requirement is a perfect life, having perfect righteousness, Jesus is the one who lived the perfect life in righteousness, and his righteousness is applied to Abraham, even in the Old Testament. Abraham believed all of God's promises. I've reworked the verbiage on some of these charts. Abraham believed all of God's promises about defeating sin and Satan. So Abraham made a conscious choice to believe. And for years after that, see, Abraham's 75 when he leaves Ur of the Chaldees. We don't know when he first believed. He could have believed when he was 60, when he was 50, when he was 30, when he was 15. We don't know. Somewhere along the line, he, we know he reached God consciousness, and someone told him, gave him specific information about Yahweh's sacrifices and God's provision uh, for sin and the defeat of Satan and evil. So then, after living a faith life where he faithfully obeyed God, God is going to call him out for a special blessing. He does this with people all the time today. You have believers who are faithful and God blesses them in, in some way. He blesses them not because they're righteous, but he blesses them because they have the capacity because they have been walking with the Lord. So Abram's been walking with the Lord, and God's, but he hadn't gotten there yet. You can go back and listen to a series. I did some short versions recently in Tucson where um, I identified, I can't remember now, 10 or 12 tests that God took Abraham through. You know, the first test is he says, I'm going to give you this land. Go down there and, and, um, and live. So he goes into the land. Next thing you know, there's a famine. It's hot. It's dry. It's not raining. Food's running out. Abraham has a choice. Am I going to trust God? This is the land he gave me. Am I going to trust God to take care of me here? Or am I going to try to solve the problem my own way? And so he went to Egypt, and there was a lot of collateral damage from going to Egypt because that's where he picked up Hagar, and that's the root of the whole Arab-Israeli conflict. So Abram goes through these tests. The last test is the one we'll talk about next week which is in Genesis 22, when God tells him, I want you to take your son, your only son. Now, most books for children, everything, picture Isaac as a kid. Isaac is probably a 30 or 40-year-old man by this time. Abram's hopes for the future, this is the seed, this is the promised one. God gave me Isaac through whom the promises will come. And so God shows up and says, I want you to take him to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to slit his throat and kill him. And Abraham's just like, well, of course, God's going to be true to his promise. I finally learned that, so I'm going to go there, and I'm going to sacrifice my son because God's going to bring him back from the dead, and it's not going to matter. God's just testing me to see if I trust him, that he's going to fulfill his promises like he said through Isaac. So no matter what I do, as long as I'm obedient to God, that's the key. And so he passed that last test. And so the whole of this is all about that. And that's what comes up in James chapter 2, talking about that second arena of justification. But what we're told there at the end of it, the scripture was fulfilled, that is after he passes that last test, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted or imputed to him for righteousness. And then it says, and he was called the friend of God. Now, we don't know exactly when God called him a friend. The, the noun there for a friend is philos. Jesus says, it makes this point to his disciples. He said, you are my friends. And he uses that same word. It indicates a close, intimate involvement. Now, he can't get that 
unless there's been um, reconciliation. And so that's, that's what's important. How did Abraham become God's friend? We have to remember, first of all, that before we're justified, we're sinners, and our lack of righteousness keeps us from God. Passages we're familiar with, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory or the entire essence of God. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were sinners, another word for that is rebels against God's authority. Christ died for us. Romans 5.10 identifies it as when we were enemies. So that's our relationship before we're saved. We're enemies. We're sinners. We're rebels against God. And so God solves the problem, and we see this in Romans 4.1, which takes us back to Genesis 15.6, where Paul says, if Abraham was justified by works, well, then he'd have something to boast about. But what does the scripture say? And he quotes Genesis 15.6, Abraham believed God. And so uh, Paul concludes, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but debt. And his whole point is God saves us by grace not by works. And, Moses, and uh, Abraham did this before the law, before the covenant. See, the circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, and it was also part of the Mosaic law. But long before he did any of that, God has justified him. So Paul's point is it's not based on works. Second point is that one of the consequences of Abraham's new possession of righteousness is that at the same time he received the imputation of righteousness, he had peace with God. They're like two sides of the same coin. God, You can't have peace with God if you don't have righteousness. So the instant you have righteousness, you have peace with God. Because the peace with God here is the absence of what we talked about earlier, that enmity, that sinful rebellion against God. Romans 5.10, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we have been reconciled. It's tense time again, grammar point. Having been, rec uh, having been um, reconciled. When did that happen? Past, present, or future? Past. We shall be saved by the life. What's that, past, present, or future? You can tell just by knowing English if you know English. That's future. Well, wait a minute. I thought salvation and reconciliation were synonyms, not in Romans. In Romans, the word saved is not a synonym for justification or reconciliation or anything related to phase one. It's always related to either the spiritual life, number one. It's related to glorification, number two. And what's the third one? It's related to the physical deliverance of the Jews at the end of the tribulation in Romans 10 and Romans 11. It's never used to refer to initial justification or reconciliation. It's always distinguished from that. So the third thing is that Abram was declared righteous by God before God gave the promises of the covenant. But still, Abram had to learn to trust God. So we're going to stop there, come back next week, and we will look at this passage in James and the second kind of justification, which is not related at all to eternal life, but it's a second form of justification. So with our heads bowed, Father, thank you for this time to study this and to be just walk through again the importance of our understanding that justification is not making us um, righteous, but declaring us righteous, that we are declared righteous because we possess the righteousness of Christ not because we possess our own righteousness. We are still sinners. So, Father, we pray that we can really come to understand grace because that's what this is all about. So, Father, we pray that we will be clear on this critical doctrine related to our salvation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.